Grace and peace are yours from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today, Revelation chapter 7, it was just read. At verse 13, one of the elders asked me, that is John, these in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is the word of our Lord. In the name of our risen and ascended Savior, who has promised to come and rescue us, your fellow redeemed. Since my wife and I are mostly empty nesters, I do have a 25 and a half year old daughter who at least sleeps at home and eats my food. <laughs> but she works a lot, so she's rarely at home. Since my wife and I are mostly empty nesters, the one or two nights that I am at home during the week, she and I relax, well, I'm going to put that in air quotes, by watching television. You see, for us, television is hazardous combat. Because of that wonderful invention called the DVR, the Digital Video Recorder, my wife can record hundreds of hours of stuff that she made her watch. But there it is. And the one night when I have put aside my computer, I've turned my cell phone down to silence and promised not to look at it unless it's my youngest son who lives in Juneau, Alaska and never calls. I'll interrupt everything for him. We turn to the guide on the DVR and we find something we want to watch. And as soon as we settle on it, knowing that because you can fast forward through the commercials, and our show actually takes about 42 minutes, and you can get three shows in almost two and a half hours, I mean, that, that's from after supper till bedtime for me. <laughs> I can binge watch something. I can watch almost a whole month's worth of shows in just that short time. The problem is, is that by the time the two and a half plus hours are done, I'm pretty tired. Why? Because my wife and I compete. We watch these shows with really one intention, not to sit back and relax, not to comment on the folly of human reality in today's world, but to try to figure out the ending before the other one does. It's competition. I tell you what, I got scars right now. I'm kidding. I don't have scars. <laughs> Brother Wally's taping this. It's going to get back to my wife. I just know it. <laughs> we, we will sit there and, and we will just pay attention to the plot, the subplot. We'll look at the shady characters. If it's a murder mystery, we'll try to figure out who did it. If it's a different type of mystery, we'll try to figure out what the ending is going to be. And the other night, the credits weren't even off the screen. And my wife said, he did it. He killed his daughter-in-law. And I said, D did you watch this already? No, 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 I didn't watch it. And sure enough, she was right. <laughs> it must be because of all the formulaic reality in some of these 42-minute shows that they stretch out with commercials into an hour. But about a month ago, maybe a month and a half, we sat down, we scrolled to the bottom of the DVR thing where the movies are, and we picked a movie that somehow or another my wife had taped and I'd never heard of it. And we started watching it. And, and yeah, the competition was there. First 15 to 20 minutes, my wife was convinced that so-and-so was going to be guilty. About 45 minutes into the movie, she changed her mind. But she's allowed to do that. About an hour and a half in the movie, she wasn't so sure anymore. Should she go back to the first guy she accused, or does she have somebody else in mind? And at the very end of the movie, both of us, mouths wide open, jaws drop. It was not even close to the ending we thought it should be. Now, we're not professional screenwriters. That movie, I mean, it's the first time in my DVR life that I got to the end and I did not press delete. 
So I want to watch that thing again. I want to see if go back and did I miss some clues? Did, did, did I, I misinterpret something that I ordinarily, was I tired from a red-eye flight home and my wife was taking advantage of me being tired so that she could win? But she didn't! Because she didn't figure it out either. The future. What's coming up can often be a great mystery. We often try to guess, formulate educated thoughts, and in a town like this, play the odds. But when it comes to our Christian future, there really should be no doubt, right? We have a whole book written for us called the Bible in which there are 66 individual books that are clear and plain. At least we think so. Then why is it that sometimes we take something like the text we have for today from the book of Revelation and we, we shy away from it? We wonder if we can understand it. Now, I do believe and understand that the book of Revelation is just a little bit different. After <coughs> all, it's apocryphal writing. <clears throat> and the vast majority of the book is nothing more than John writing down visions that he had of heaven. And some of those visions are, are rather unique. I know every now and then when I finish reading chapter 12 and get into Revelation, it might take me just a little while to get to sleep. Because that's the chapter with the dragons. And we're not used to that type of literature. But every now and then, from just like right now in chapter 7, we get a clear picture of our future. Because John is given a glimpse of heaven. And in that glimpse of heaven, he sees some wonderful things. Things that are meant to give us comfort. Things that are meant to give us hope. Things that are meant to give us security. And the greatest of all those things, in my opinion, and I'm standing in front of here with the rope to preach, is the fact that John sees everybody dressed in white robes. <coughs> it's a unique vision. It's a vision that kind of develops itself and builds on itself. First of all, in the beginning of our section, John looks into heaven and it's very clear. He does not see just himself. He does not see just those that were left over from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And I think that that's what John probably thought he would see. After all, throughout the Old Testament, God was very, very specific about how his chosen people, the ones whom he loved more than everybody else on the earth, they would be found in heaven. And yet all the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, we read that one of God's chosen people, Abraham, understood what heaven was about. When Moses writes down, Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see, in John's day, when Jesus came to earth, the vast majority of those who called themselves God, God's people were no longer looking for a savior from sins on which to trust. They felt and believed that their cultural underpinning, including the blood that ran in their veins, their DNA, would be more than enough to save them. After all, hadn't God, God promised that his people would be in heaven? And certainly, in the Old Testament, his people, well, those were the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. God had preserved them so that when John was alive, Jesus could be born. But when John looks in heaven, what does he see? He sees every tribe, language, nation, and 
people. It's, it's not the homogenous view that many of his friends, co-workers, and family members had. It was not the individual racial view that Jews had had for a thousand years, thinking that only by their bloodline, but rather it was a wide open panorama of unique shades and colors. Reminds me of this joke, and, and if you've heard it already, or if I'm the one who shared it with you already, just laugh politely at the end like you've never heard it before. <laughs> Guy dies and goes to heaven. St. Peter meets him at the gate. I'm not sure why they give such a great job to us, but St. Peter meets him at the gate. And St. Peter says, remember, Jesus said that in my, in my father's house there are many rooms. Well, guess what? There are many rooms. You get to choose which room you're going to spend eternity in. And thought, pretty good idea. Let's see a few rooms. So they walk down a long hall. First door opens up, and there are just a bunch of believers in that room. They are clapping, their hands are swaying, they are singing out loudly, and St. Peter says, this, this is the Baptist room. <laughs> Comes down to the next door, opens it up, and everybody is reverent, hands are folded. I mean, you could just feel the aura of respect for God, even though the lips were barely even moving. And St. Peter says this, this is the Presbyterian room. And then he goes down a little bit further. And right before he gets to the door, he turns around to the gentleman and St. Peter does. He goes, shh. The man looks and he says, what, what, what do you mean? No, St. Peter says, shh, you need to be quiet. This next room is the Wisconsin Synod room. And they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> I'm glad you left so long because you understand that that's not the case. But in John's day, they were convinced that by their bloodline, by their divine right, so when John sees people, language, tribe, and nation, it had to set them back a little bit. But there was one thing that unified everybody. They were all wearing white robes. John does not have an explanation for the white robes yet, because as the text goes on, they were also all unified in singing their praises to God. In fact, we have those longer selections. You see all of these nouns. Salvation belongs to our God. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. They're all united. The, the, this multi-ethnic panoramic view of heaven is truly united, all singing their praises to God. They all knew why they were there. They all knew who got the credit. And not a single voice was left out. But in the middle of this cacophony of joyous praise to God, one of the elders who's been standing around the side turns to John and says, you know, everybody here is white robe. Where did you come from? And John, he just, he just kind of backs off. Probably doesn't want to make a mistake. Also wants to make sure that the elder carries a day. And so John says, sir, you know. And then the elder says, these? These people in white robes, this every language, tribe, nation, and people, everybody you see up here, they've all come through the great tribulation and they've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. That's why they're white. Now I'm going to have to put in a little bit of a warning thing on the bottom. Don't do this at home. Don't grab your favorite piece of clothing Throw it into that washing machine, go get some blood, put the blood in the washing machine, and press on. It won't work. And not just because there's no cleansing value. It's because that's not the blood of the Lamb. But the fact remains is that there are many, many, many people on earth who have convinced themselves that they can do their own washing. 
that they can build themselves up in some way, make themselves presentable to God. And yet when John looks into heaven, not a single one of those souls is there. That's not part of the vision of heaven that John sees. John does not see people who presented themselves at the gate and said, well, here I am, here's my resume, here are my credits, and here is my whitewashed robe. Can I come in? Because the minute that that person presents himself to heaven carrying anything other than the blood of the Lamb, there will be a stern and hard no. Because nothing other than the blood of the Lamb makes white robes. It was Jesus who left that perfect heaven in which he had no sin, never experienced it. And he came to earth to be born, to live among sinners, to interact with sinners, and to suffer the consequence of sin on earth. His death on the cross. And it was only his blood that was shed on the cross that makes our robes white. No other blood, no other person, no other individual, certainly not our own works and abilities and opportunities because very honestly, you and I can't even begin to tell the future. But Christ would, from his body, which he lived perfectly here on this earth, that blood makes us wear white robes. And, and, and what a unique time to bring that message when you and I get to celebrate here with that very blood. Don't go pouring it on your clothes. That's not the way it works. <laughs> but rather, take and eat, take and drink. Because there, that body and blood of Christ connected with this bread and wine, that gives us white robes. It puts us in the middle of this vision that John sees almost 2,000 years ago. Have you thought about that for a second? When John looked into heaven and he saw all those tribes, languages, nations, and peoples, he was seeing us. Because by the grace of God and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and faith in him, you and I are wearing red robes. We're there in John's vision. Which means that right now, on the 18th of November, the year 2018, you and I know the future. Well, we don't know the exact date. We don't know the exact time. We don't know the exact way. But we do know that because of what Christ did for us and because of his body and blood, you and I are wearing white robes. And we have something glorious to look forward to. In fact, that's the whole last couple of verses of our text, isn't it? The beautiful picture of heaven in which you and I will no longer be tormented and suffer with the consequences of our sins. My bum knee or ankle. My wife's uncanny ability to try to project and prophesy what's going to happen in the show when the credits are still on there. None of that's going to be there. But rather, not a tear in our eye, not a single sunburn. All of us will be in the exact perfect climate that we desire, which will be very unique about my part of heaven. Because my dear wife loves 50 degrees. I love 90. <laughs> so my part of heaven is going to be just a little bit warmer. 
but both <coughs> of us will be perfect. And not because we did something to earn or deserve it, or not because we presented our hand-washed robes to God, but because he dresses us in Christ's righteousness, his blood, to give us those white robes. So I can tell you, you, you know the future. It's not going to do you any good about two and a half miles west of here. No one there cares about white robes. But it's going to do you good. Now, knowing, and the day when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth and calls his people, those who know they are wearing white robes, to himself. And that's when, yeah, it'll become clearer. We'll become more aware. We'll become more fulfilled. And every doubt about the book of Revelation will be gone. Because you and I will live together in heaven, wearing those white robes that have been washed in the blood You know the future. You are what the day celebrates. Saints triumphant. Because finally, the whole book of Revelation can really be summed up with two very short sentences. Two very great and glorious short sentences. Jesus won. It wasn't even close. Amen. Please stand.